Hello, my name is Cliff, and I'm going to talk to you about space. Yes, I'm not on stage, you'll be like wondering, because I'm behind you. I'm making you feel very uncertain and vulnerable right now. You don't know what's going on, if I'm going to pounce on you or anything like that. <laughs> and that is all about the space around you, because many people are not aware of what goes on around them. And you'll be surprised how much your environment can affect the way you feel and in turn, the way you perform and also your destiny and everything after that. So, we are going to talk about how your environment, your space and you and your mind come together in a nice balance. And I'm going to talk about that today. So, what is, um, like, what if I tell you that by moving your bed around, your relationship will change, you'll break up with your partner. Or if I move your desk around, you'll suddenly get, a, like, a better job and earn tons of money. It sounds far-fetched, right? But it's really not if you explain it properly. Let's use the example of the desk. If I were to, if, if let's say you're working from home and you're working in the middle of the kitchen with, like, your kids running around, you don't have kids, like, with kids running around and your parents are, like, cooking, there's lots of commotion, lots of uh, uh, movement and energy around you. Yes, you can put your headphones to try to focus, but it's quite distracting. It's not so easy to do it well. So, Compare this to have putting you in a nice quiet office with, a, with some nice views of the garden outside. It's much easier to focus. You don't have to worry about trying to focus because you're already there in the right environment. And then if you do well, in turn, you can get a good job. And in turn, you get promotion. And in turn, you get tons of money. So it's all cause and effect. So having the right environment will lead to better things. And we are here to learn about how your environment can affect you and how to make the most of it. So. What is feng shui? If you do a simple internet search, it would, it would say, describe it as uh, ancient Chinese geomancy, the balance of the energy and creating harmony between you and your environment. It sounds all very up in the air, it sounds very spiritual, very superstitious, but it's actually really, really practical. I've written a book called Feng Shui Modern and I've got, one, I've got a, a one-star review saying that this book is nothing but common sense because that's what I'm trying to do. We are trying to talk about, like decipher, like demystify this whole concept, this ancient Chinese art that came from 3,000 years ago, to bring it up to today for everybody to understand and only when you understand can you make the most of it. To me, Feng Shui is just creating the perfect and the best environment for yourself so that you can feel good and if you feel good, you will perform well and when you perform well, only good things can come. So, when, uh, when it comes to this balance of space, when you, do, when you create a nice environment for yourself, you will feel better. And you can also use it in like, like certain tricky, sneaky ways. You can use it to gain an upper hand when you have competition. You can put your rivals down. That's like the art of warfare. It's very interesting how your space alone can change how all these things turn out. So when it comes to feng shui, how do you actually apply it? Like, we have to first understand that feng shui is not superstition. It, it, in Chinese cosmology, one's destiny is governed by three different things. One of them is heaven, the things that cannot be controlled, like chance, whether it's going to rain today, if you were gambling, what card will be pulled out, things like that, who will appear in your life, these are all luck, fortune, you cannot change that. The second fortune is the fortune of man, which is yourself, how hardworking you are, how uh, determined or passionate you are to achieving the things that you want to achieve, that is all up to you. And finally, there's the fortune of the earth, which is your environment, and this is feng shui. It's how nice, how, uh, how your environment can support you. So, no matter how clever you are, how lucky you are, if I were to put you in a damp cellar to study, it's very difficult. It's not that you can't, it's just that you must really concentrate and focus away, like not look at the mice running around you, just try to focus and study. But if I put you in a nice room, like before, in a nice room with good ventilation, good natural light, you don't have to worry about all those things and you, it, it will help. I tend to compare uh, feng shui with going to a good school. Like going to a good school, you have all the best teachers, all the best peers, but it doesn't guarantee that you will ultimately do well. It doesn't guarantee you'll get the job that you want or whatever that you want. And conversely, if I put you in a horrible school with bad, bad, bad um, people and, and, and like no resources, it doesn't mean that you can't do well. It helps. So your environment helps. It doesn't determine, it doesn't make it such that like your, your future is set. It just um, assists you in what you want to achieve. 
So, uh, when we apply feng shui, there's, it, it comes with uh, it's a two pronged approach. One of them is understanding and making the best use of your environment, and the second is to know yourself and who is using the environment. So I'll start with the first one, which is understanding your environment, right? So you, uh, you have heard of this concept of qi, of energy, because every space has energy around us. It's like this woohoo, like ooh, there's, there's qi, there's energy, I can feel the energy. Um, in, in, in Mandarin, qi translates actually to air and not energy. So it's not as dynamic as you might think. It's much more subtle, much more intuitive. It's more of the vibes of a space, very, very subtle things, like the corner of this table, the X behind me, the T that's a bit wonky. So it's these kind of things that creates the, the energy, uh, like the, the vibes of your room. I, I'll try to put you into this space. Imagine you are in a room with four walls and a ceiling and a floor. Just a square box room. Imagine you're in this dark room. There's no windows, no nothing, and it's quiet. So you're in this cell. There's no energy whatsoever. Well, actually, there is energy. In feng shui, this is called like a dead type of energy. You're in, a, you're in a tomb. But let's ignore that for a second. So you are in a room with no windows, no doors, nothing, and you're in this complete silence. Suddenly, I open a little hole in the corner. Ding, and then the, the, a beam of light shines in, ding, and it shines in. And no matter how hard you try to control, you can't stop yourself from looking towards the window because there is a source of energy. It draws your attention, it draws you in. This is an example of light being an energy. Then as the light shines in, you notice that all along there was this massive chandelier dangling above your head, like just three inches above you. And you are like, oh, what's that? And you feel the weight of this chandelier. You know it's not going to drop on you, but you still take a step aside just to feel a bit more comfortable, a bit more assured that this thing is not going to fall on you. That is another form of qi, another form of energy, where there's this uncertainty of the danger, of a risk. That is another thing that we would uh, 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 acknowledge and appreciate. Then suddenly you hear a noise from uh, the other side of the wall. And, you, and this brings back the memories, like you understand that that is a person's voice. You un understand that help means that this person is in danger. And you suddenly, this sense chills down your back. You're like, oh no, what's going on? Why am I here? And why is someone screaming, help me, help me from the other side? This creates this sense of fear. And that is another form of energy. And as you look around this room looking for a way to escape, you suddenly notice that there's a little doorknob. Small, it's a door. There's no light coming in, unlike the window. But you notice a little handle, and suddenly this door becomes more of an energy source than the window with all its light because you know this is where you can escape. So you open the door and you run out. And so in this little exercise, you have experienced many forms of energy and how it affects the way you feel. And that is how we should analyze our space because these can always affect the way we feel in our spaces. Of course, this is a very simplified example. And in real life, rooms are much more complicated than that. So you'd be wondering, like, how am I going to decipher all that with my simple mind? I don't know anything about this. Well, you already do. Think about it. Let's say you are trying to, like, if you are going to a cafe and you want to find a nice place to sit and have a nice drink for the, for the next few hours, you walk in the cafe. You, there's a seat right there, right at the entrance. Would you sit there? No, you would not because it's right by the entrance. It's a bit silly. So you walk in a bit further and there is the, the, the counter where you order the drinks. You could sit there, it's a bit deeper, but you still wouldn't put yourself there because it's a little bit busy, a little bit hectic. People might spill drinks over you, things like that. So you are trying to find a better location. There's one spot right at the end, quite quiet, quite private, but it's next to the bathroom. You can hear the, the hand dryer, you can hear people walking in and out and maybe even some smells. So not quite right. And eventually you end up in a seat next to the window, furthest from the door. You can see everybody in the cafe. You can look out and people watch a bit. It feels good. You feel comfortable and there you are. So within those few moments, you are able to decipher this entire room, find the space that suits you best and put yourself there. So this is the idea of energy. The next idea is about yourself and your use. So let's say, returning to that cafe analogy, you are there not really to sit and drink by yourself. You are there because you want to meet your friends to have a nice chit chat. You might not sit far, far away because your friends might not see you. You might actually sit next to the counter, the second position, which was initially not so good. You might sit there because you want to order lots of drinks nonstop throughout the, throughout the evening. 
So de depending on your purpose and your use, your circumstances might affect the type of room that's best for you. And this is another, con another very important concept to know because there is no such thing as a good or a bad space. For example, you have a very busy, uh, busy street, lots of people. That is not the best place to sleep or rest, but it's a great place to set up a little stall, to sell stuff, to promote things. So if your idea was to get customers to sell something, you, this busy street would work very well for you, but not so well for someone who is trying to fall asleep. The, the type of use is one thing, but another very important idea that we need to acknowledge is also who you are as a person. For example, if you, you know some people are like night owls, some people are morning people. For the night owls, you kind of do best in the stillness of the night when it's really, really quiet, you can focus and you do your work. Whereas for some people, they, be, they perform better in the early mornings when the sun is shining and beaming in. So different people have different preferences and they know what suits them best and what does not suit them. And so Feng Shui acknowledges that as well. We try to guess who you are. We use numerology, like a bit like horoscopes, you know, based on your star sign, what kind of character you are, things like that. It's not very easy to, to, to predict correctly, but at least you know that it's something that is worth acknowledging, that no two people are alike, are the same, and it's worth to really ask this person what suits you and what does not suit you. So having these two in mind, the, um, the space and the person, we bring them together. We want to find the best possible space for you. And like, for example, I, I want to sleep and this room is really bright. So what I do, I, I know I'm someone who likes a dark environment to sleep and the room is too bright. So I draw the curtains and it becomes nice and peaceful and quiet. So that's how you bring it together to create the best possible environment for you. Then, uh, remember earlier on I spoke about this idea that you can kind of uh, 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 have fight your rivals and win in a competition using the idea of feng shui. Now, this is a very important and interesting idea behind feng shui and it's known as the command position. Okay, so we understand that this practice came from 3,000 years ago when the world was very different. People like to kill each other and fight. And so safety is the most important thing. To begin with, you need to feel safe before you can focus on other things. So we need to understand this idea of the command position, which is the part of a room that you feel most secure and you feel like there is no vulnerabilities. You can't be attacked from behind. And you know all of us have only one set of eyes looking forward. We don't know what's going on behind us. And so we acknowledge the idea that where, wherever we are, we don't want uncertain things happening behind us where we cannot see. We want to be able to see what's going on and feel protected and that's why we have a wall behind us. So if I took a chair, you can see, so here I have a nice black chair. So if I sat like this, right, if I sat like this, I cannot, I don't know what's going on behind me. I don't know if you're going to throw rotten eggs at me or anything. I feel really uncertain. I feel very uncalm, just as you felt uncalm when I was behind you and you cannot see. This auditorium is designed in a way that gives you the upper hand. You can see what's going on. You can attack me, I cannot attack you back. And so I need to get, gather a lot of courage to talk to you, whereas you don't need to gather any courage at all to just listen to me. So, what does this have to do with relationships and like uh, uh, creating an upper hand when you're fighting with someone? So, the best example I can think of is, you know when you have an interview, you have the interviewer sitting like this with the company logo behind them, and then you have the interviewee sitting over here. Let me put it at a slight angle so you can see. And here they are interviewing you. They're like, maybe I need a small assistant. Can I ask my lovely stuntman to come? Thank you very much. So he, here we have Ayush, our interviewee for the day. He wants to apply for a job. And I am the boss of TEDx. Here I am. And you come in. Have a, go to the door. Go to the door. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, you knock the door. Knock, knock, knock. Thank you. Come in. Perfect. So he's in a vulnerable position right now. He is walking in. I am in command of my space. I am owning TEDx. I am the biggest person in this room. And he is very nervous, very shy. Come in. He's in a vulnerable position with the door behind him. And I say, take a seat. And he is remaining in this vulnerable position throughout the entire meeting. 
he, I can ask him to leave, he, ca he, he can just turn around, he doesn't know if the security guard is going to come in and drag him out halfway through. He is feeling, feeling vulnerable while I'm feeling super secure. Now you might say that, of course I feel secure because I'm the owner of the company, I would feel secure by default. Well, not necessarily the case. Let's try this again. You go out the door, and now he knocks on the door. Okay, come in. So now I put my interviewee in the command position and he automatically feels much more comfortable because he knows that he can see everything around me. He knows if anything is going to happen to him and even if I told him to leave, he will have to walk around and behind me, making me feel vulnerable. So by knowing where is your command position, so I, I, I need to leave now, thank you. So uh, by knowing where is your command position, thank you very much. So by knowing where is your command position and where and how you can feel better, you can also gain the upper hand and this works very much in dining situations. So normally you will put the VIP in the best seat in the house and you as the host, you are running around, you will kind of put yourself in the worst seat and so you can serve people or if you, are, if you don't like your guests, you will put yourself there and let your guests sit in the less nice position. So this is just an example of how um, it's it, like you can use it for evil, but you can also use it for good, which is creating the best possible environment for yourself so you can flourish. So I know feng shui is not really a science, it's more like, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit up in the air. It's also, it's very intuitive, you know, it's how you feel and nobody has the right answer apart from yourself and you don't have the kind of training or experience as I do, but at least you acknowledge or now that you are aware that your environment does play a part in how you behave and you perform in daily life and it's always a good idea to take this into account whenever, wherever you are, when you're finding a seat on a plane or finding a seat in an auditorium or finding a house or arranging your bedrooms. You want to do it in the way that it supports you. When you're putting your desk, so often do people sit in a way that their desk is like that and the door is behind them and they wonder, why do I not feel like I can concentrate on my, on my desk? Why do I feel like I, I keep procrastinating? Because you are always like uh, being bugged by the idea that someone could be knocking behind, opening your door, looking at the private things that you're viewing and surfing at night. And you don't want that to happen. You want to feel nice and secure. And that's when you can really focus. So at least you are aware that it happens and you are also aware that you have it in you. It's just about tapping and be being observant about your environment and making the most of it so that you can flourish and have a nice life. So now you know.